Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm your host, Richard Byrne, and you're here for Copyright and Creative Commons for K-12 Educators. Uh, a few things to take, uh, take note of before we begin. First of all, we have 68 people who have signed up, and a big thank you to all of you who have signed up, and to those of you who donated to help make this one happen, a big thank you to you as well. And I can see more and more people are signing in as we go. Welcome, Amy, Betsy, Connie, Deb. Oh my goodness, names keep popping up. Uh, Kathy, Mary, Jody, Jude. Holy cow, more, oh, there's another one. Melinda just popped in, and Pam and Patty, and Skip Z. Hello, Skip and Sheila. Thank you so much for joining me today. All right, so for those of you who have never been in a webinar with me before, or you've never used GoToWebinar before, a couple of little quirks about GoToWebinar that you should probably be aware of. Number one, there is a Q&A panel in GoToWebinar. Please take advantage of that. That should have launched on the bottom right corner of your screen, or perhaps bottom left corner of your screen, depending on how you have your, your PC set up, your laptop set up. Uh, but you should have that Q&A panel there. Feel free to use that at any time. The questions that come in there, only I see. So feel free to ask anything at all in there. Oh, awesome, Skip. That's great, great news. And see, I just reacted to something Skip sent me that was uh, it was a, a private message there. But uh, yeah, that's awesome, Skip. <laughs> um, so that's fantastic. All right. Uh, so let's go ahead and tell you just a little bit about me. Number one, number one job in my life. I'm a dad to two little girls, Isla and Emma. My full-time day job is teaching high school computer science. Uh, prior to that, I taught social studies for about a decade. And I also spent a number of years as a professional development consultant to a bunch of schools. And I'm a big fan of dark roast coffee, but since it's four o'clock in the afternoon, I'm drinking my nice lime seltzer right now. All that to say, I am not an attorney, uh, but I have had a lot of firsthand experience with copyright and creative commons uh, in terms of both defend, in terms of defending it and in terms of helping people understand what it means in the context of a K-12 school setting. If you are here as a college instructor, I should point out to you that there are some differences uh, that will apply to you, and I'll re refer to those uh, if they pop up, uh, and I'll refer you to some resources for that as well. There are some differences between what a K-12 school can do and what a college uh, level can do. But we'll take care of those as they come up. So let's start with let's start with this question of why should teachers care about copyright? Okay. Uh, or And connected to that, why should students care about copyright? If you're here, you obviously care about it on some level. I'm going to assume that if you're here today, you, you care about copyright on some level. And one of the things that I always like to point out about this, sorry, I just lost my, uh, <laughs> just hit my escape key there. Uh, one of the things I always want to point out about this is that for 90% of the cir circumstances, um, teachers can will violate copyright and nothing will happen. But then there's that 10% where, yeah, something could really happen that, that's not good. But the bigger thing is we want to model this for our students. We want to model good di digital citizenship for our students. That's the biggest reason we should care about it. There are cases where, yes, people have pursued legal action against teachers or against schools. I'm going to share two of those cases today, but those are the exception to the rule. The bigger issue is modeling it for our students so that when they leave the comfort of, a, of their K-12 school setting, that they're not going out and violating copyright rules by accident right, because no one's ever taught that. So, so just a quick little rundown of you know, possible consequences for copyright violations, right? Nothing, that, that, that's a big one, nothing. Uh, you know, the, it's possible that nothing would happen. Right? 
Uh, there's the issue of looking bad in front of peers. I have been to more um, conference settings and professional development settings than I care to admit where someone has used an image that still has a watermark on it. Raise your hand. Use that raise hand icon and go to webinar. If you've ever seen someone do that, right? If you've ever seen a colleague or a principal do that, right? And it just looks bad, right? It just looks bad. Right? You get that very pixelated image that says Shutterstock still on it, right? Uh, that, that's never a good look. That's never a good look for anybody, right? So you don't want to look bad. Right? Uh, but on a more serious note, right? you will you may get a DMCA takedown notice, a Digital Millennial Copyright Act takedown notice, which is a legal notice to take the material offline. If you've put it on a blog or you've used it in a video, uh, particularly more and more teachers are making videos to put on YouTube, whether that's for instructional purposes or for other, other reasons. And YouTube, Google, is pretty vigilant about complying with DMCA takedown notices. It makes it really easy for people who are the content owners, the copyright owners, to quickly file a notice and say, take this down. Uh, and you get, if you get in the world of YouTube, if you get too many of those notices on your account, your account gets shut down and you have no recourse. Uh, you know, and so that, that's where you might see your digital content just boom, taken down with that notice. And sometimes this happens accidentally, right? Uh, I'll share with you that one time I did this accidentally. I was making a video, I made a video about how to use Edpuzzle. And I'm sure many of you have used Edpuzzle. I made a video about how to use Edpuzzle. And in that video, I chose to show how to use Edpuzzle with a TED Ed lesson. And I only showed about 20 seconds of a TED Ed video in my video, but TED Ed is pretty vigilant about protecting their copyright. And I got flagged with a copyright violation because it showed a little bit of the TED Ed video inside my video that I was really just trying to show someone how to use Edpuzzle. So that does happen. Right? I wasn't even trying to, I wasn't even trying to make a copyright violation. And it happened, right? So it does happen. Uh, and in those cases, sometimes your content just disappears. You might get a bill from a copyright holder. I have seen that happen to people where they actually get a bill. This happens a lot of times with, with photographs of things in science, right? particularly things like entomology. Uh, I, I've seen many cases, for whatever reason, entomologists who take pictures of their bugs are really protective of their bug pictures. <laughs> and so I have seen more than a few cases where people have gotten bills from a copyright holder because it was used without without consent. Uh, and you know, last but not least is, is a lawsuit. Right? So, so I'll give you one other example of this where I accidentally had a copyright issue on my classroom blog, this was back when I was teaching social studies. So we're going back to 2009, right? Back in 2009, I got a copyright violation uh, filed against my classroom blog, right? Not my professional blog, not free tech for teachers, my classroom blog, which was mrburnteaches.com, right? Someone put a complaint on there because I had found a video on YouTube. I found a video on YouTube that used the YouTube embed code. It was called the Civil War in Four Minutes. Some of you who are history teachers might remember this. This made the rounds. It was viral back in 2009, uh, so 12 years ago. I embedded that into my blog. And I had my students watch it and write some comments about it down below. Well, I got a notice via Blogger, the service I was using for the, my blog, that the person who had made that video was filing a copyright complaint because the person who had uploaded the video to YouTube didn't have the rights to do that. Right? So it was like two degrees away, someone who uploaded it to YouTube 
didn't have the rights to do that. I got the embed code, put it in my blog, still got the copyright violation notice. So it, it, it happens. So let's think about this. From a student perspective, and I'll give you some other examples of student perspective here. Uh, the biggest thing I want, I want to start with is just get students and your colleagues to stop right clicking on Google Images okay? uh, for a variety of reasons. Number one, uh, when you right click on the first image that pops up, okay, oftentimes students or your colleagues are saving a very low resolution, grainy image, sometimes with a watermark on it. Okay? They just look bad. Number two, uh, depending on the image and where the image is hosted, they might be downloading some other things in the background that you don't want them to have on their computers or they don't want to have on their computers. Okay. And number three, Google Images by default doesn't apply licensing filters. It does have those options and we'll look at them right now. So let's look at this. So, Let's have our students do a Google image search. Somebody give me something that their, their students might be uh, searching for. It's a picture your students might be looking for. If you want to put that in the Q&A, you can. Okay, all right, I'll do that one. Elephant. All right. All right. So let's do that one. Oh, and there's another suggestion in there. Oh, President Biden, main mammals. All right, all right. Well, we got a whole bunch of them. All right, all right. So let's do let's do elephant. All right. And so one of the things we want our students to do is to not okay, do this. Right click, save image as. Right. That's a horrible. That, that's horrible. Right. So let's go in. And turn on their tools for their usage rights. Okay. And we'll see Creative Commons licenses. Okay. So, Creative Commons, let's talk about Creative Commons. Creative Commons doesn't mean you can use it without citing it. You still have to cite it. You still have to cite it. And I still don't want my students right clicking on Google Images. Let's say we pick, uh, let's pick this first one that comes up here, the Wikimedia Commons one. So let's go ahead and take a look at that image directly. So here's the image itself. Let's hit the download button. And when we download, we're going to see all the attribution information right there that we can just highlight and copy. And one of the things that I will have students do is put that information into a Google Doc or into their slides directly as they are building a presentation. If they're building a presentation, I'll um, put it right into, this, into the speaker notes of their Google Slides as they go through. If they're doing it for another purpose, let's say they're making a video, I'll have them put it in a Google Doc. If you're a Microsoft person, have them put them in a Word Doc. But have them keep track of those as they go through. Much easier than trying to go back in and figure it out later. Now, we still want to go through this description and make sure that it actually is an image that is truly Creative Commons licensed because Google Images isn't always accurate in the licensing. Right? This this little filter isn't always accurate. So you wanna to go to the image source, the page that it's hosted on and actually look at it. Okay. And actually look at that information. Right? And so when I hit that download button, I can see right, there is the attribution information there. I can see the Creative Commons license. And again, Creative Commons is voluntary licensing. The, the, the photographers, the artists, you know, we're talking about music, we're talking about videos. Those are artists who say, yes, you can use my work, but in this manner with attribution. Somebody said, uh, 
Maine mammals, or was it Maine mammals or marine mammals? I apologize if, it was, if I had Maine on the brain. It's normal for me, that's where I live. Um, Maine mammals, okay, Melinda. <laughs> Melinda, are you from RSU 71? Did I see that one? Okay, all right, great. I thought I saw RSU 71 on there. All right, so let's look at this, all right? Again, and one of the things you have to remind your students of, so every time they change their image search, they have to go back in and change the usage rights again, because Google Images keeps defaulting back to anything in the world that, they, that it can find. There's our Creative Commons licenses. And we can go through it and look through these. Uh, let's do let's do one that's not that's not uh, Wikimedia this time. Uh, let, let's let's do this Flickr one. Okay, so Main State Pier. Right, there's one from the Main State Pier. And again, I'm going to go in and look at the source itself. Always look at the source where the image is hosted, and look at what the usage rights say on that host. Correct, Kathy. So Kathy asked a good question to clarify. I can use Creative Commons images, but may or may not have to cite depending on what I see in that attribution section. Correct. Right. Now, in the most cases, a Creative Commons license, you will have to cite it. Uh, the differences in Creative Commons license, Creative Commons licenses, which we'll get to in just a, a, a bit here, the differences are usually in how you can reuse the work. A lot of them will say you can reuse the work for academic purposes, you can reuse the work for non-academic purposes, but you can't reuse the work for commercial purposes, or you can reuse it for academic purposes, but you can't edit it from its original format, right? So for example, a Creative Commons, you might find a Creative Commons license that says, you know, for this image here, you can, use it but you can't edit it from its original format meaning i couldn't just crop out uh you know the center section of the image and use that okay um, but creative the creative commons website is really good about explaining that and i'll show you that in a minute so that's item number one get students to stop right clicking on google images okay now Let's jump into fair use. Okay. So, you know, if we're using Google Images, great. Or we're using some other place to find images. And I have a big long list. Some of you may have already gotten the PDF that I sent out with this. Uh, I have a big long list of places to find images besides Google Images. But there may be cases where you cannot find something that's Creative Commons licensed or public domain licensed uh, that does what you need to do. It often comes up with like, current events, breaking events. When I, when I was teaching social studies, this came up with, with current events a lot of times. Like, I just couldn't find anything that was available that wasn't copyrighted right? so because, it was, because of the nature of the topic was so brand new. Uh, so that doesn't mean though that you can just go and say well because it's fair use i can use it however i want and that's not true at all right? let's talk about what does fair use mean some common misconceptions about fair use right? so number one uh you'll, you'll hear the, the misconception of oh you can use 10 percent of a Film. This comes up a lot with videos. Oh, I can use 10% of a film. I can use 10% of a film, or I can use 10% of an audio recording, or I can use, you know, 15% or what some percentage. There's no clear-cut percentage. Uh, I will share some links at the end here to the U.S. Copyright Office and their guidelines on fair use. You'll notice there is nothing mentioning a percentage of the original work. Right? So let's throw that one out the window. Uh, this one comes up a lot. Oh, I included a link to the source, therefore it's okay. No, it's not. 
Um, as I always, the, the way I always point this out is you wouldn't accept a paper from your students that was copied and pasted and they said, oh, but here's where I found it, I cited my work. And it's the same, and it's the same with, with any copyrighted media that we might find on the web. Just putting in a link to the original source doesn't mean it's not a copyright violation and doesn't make it a fair use either. this is the one that trips people up a lot but it's for education therefore i can use it and that might be true but it's not always true because here are some big things about fair use that really matter and it's the context right? is how is it shared where is it shared is there a similar alternative available that's not copyrighted. So let's think about the first question. How is it shared? If you if it's a work that's copyrighted and you are sharing it in a manner that would bring you some kind of monetary compensation, obviously not okay. But there's also the idea of are you sharing it so that you don't have to pay money to use it. A big example, a, a classic example of this is if you said to Pearson or McGraw Hill, I'm going to make 10 photocopies of the book, of the textbook. They would not be okay with that because you'd be avoiding paying them money for those 10 copies. Okay. So the, the how is it shared, right? It, again, it's really simple when you think, okay, I'm not going to try to make money on it, but there's also the context of, am I avoiding having to spend money because I'm doing this? And if you said to yourself, okay, I'm going to download this because now I won't have to buy it, or I'm going to copy and paste this because now I won't have to buy a copy of it, probably not a fair use. The question of where is it shared? It's also important. Because if you are using something that is that a, a, a artist or a writer has intended to be shared publicly, and you and you know they, they've shared it on, let's say, their their web page. They've shared it on their web page. The artist has shared their work on their web page. Good example of this is a comic called The Oatmeal. Uh, it's a little bit PG 13 ish, uh, but there's a comic called The Oatmeal that's been very popular for many, many years on the web now. And he puts all of his comics on his web page and doesn't allow them to go anywhere else, doesn't intend for them to go anywhere else because. On his web page, he's making money from ad revenue and also from selling uh, copy print copies of his work. If I come along and I grab that image and then share it on my site and say, I'm sharing it this way because uh, I want to make it easier for, for people to find it, that's not a fair use. But if I then put it on my website or I put it on my, my website as an instructional tool and said, this particular comic is the only way I can teach this topic, then I might have a, have a defense there. Okay. But I'm going to be worried about, is there a similar alternative? You have to think about what are you teaching? What are you trying to teach? If I'm trying to teach cartooning and using political cartoons, for example, I can probably teach the same concepts of satire with a political cartoon using a cartoon from 1842 that's now in the public domain just as well as I could using a comic from 2021 about satire. That's copyrighted right so if they can keep in mind what are you trying to accomplish with these things so 
So let's talk about what is Creative Commons. What is a Creative Commons work? Well, if you have not heard of Creative Commons before, or you're not quite sure about it, I'm gonna put this link in the chat. This is a breakdown of all their licenses. So provides you with all the different definitions of their licenses. And you know, the, the first one, the CCBY, lets others distribute, remix, adapt, and build upon your work, even commercially, as long as they credit you for the original creation. This is the most accommodating of licenses, recommended for maximum dissemination and use of licensed materials. And then you get into the more restrictive ones. Most restrictive one being the CC, BY, NC, and D. <laughs> All right. And that's the one where there's no derivatives. Right? Let's people download the work, right? share it with other people, as long as they give you credit, but they can't change it in any way or use them commercially. So that's what uh, I forget who asked the question a few minutes ago, but someone asked a question a few minutes ago about what is the, uh, you know, what's the difference between the Creative Commons licenses? Okay, thank you. Well, here's a breakdown. Here's a breakdown. But keep in mind, with the Creative Commons license, you're always going to need to give attribution unless it says no attribution required, okay? which might be a public domain work. Now, what is in the public domain? So, for those. If you're outside the United States, there may be some differences on this. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, my, friends in, my friends in Canada, you have uh, a little bit more uh, liberal policy around this than, than we do here in the United States, I, I believe. Uh, so keep that in mind if you're outside of the US and you're watching this. What's in, the, what's in the public domain here in the United States? If it's something that was created by a government employee on government time for a government project, government funded project, often it is in the public domain, but not always. So again, double check the source, the source page where you find the media, whether that's a picture, video, uh, audio file, text, check what it says on that source page. Okay. But in general, made by the government, by a government employee, on government time, generally is in the public domain. Okay. Works where the copyright has expired, so prior to 1923, uh, 75 years plus the life of the creator, yeah, 1923, uh, where the copyright has expired is in the public domain. Works and people have said yes, Go ahead, I release this into the public domain. And that happens more and more. Artists will do that more, photographers in particular will do that more and more to get exposure for their work and put things into the public domain and say, yes, you can use this in, it's in the public domain. You can credit me if you want, but you don't have to credit me. There are some exceptions to this. There are some exceptions to those rules of thumb that I just gave you there about public domain. Uh, and the reason there's a reason why I chose this image here. And when I originally did the draft, the, these slides are an adaptation from ones I made with my friend Beth Holland about four years ago. And we chose this image four years ago uh, when we did the first draft of this. Uh, we chose this image because at the time, there had been a lot of discussion around some of the photographs of President Obama. And the point, and people were saying, well, he is the president, therefore the images of him are in the public domain. And that's not the case. It depends on who took the picture and who they were working for when they took the picture. The official White House photographer is different than someone who is working for CBS News and takes a picture. Who's different from someone like you and I who attends a 
an event and takes a picture of the president. So it doesn't, so the, the subject matter was not what mattered. It was who took the picture. And in this case, it was the official White House photographer, who again, working for the government on government time. And that's why that one was in the public domain. So let's talk about where can we find some copyright friendly materials. One of my biggest tips is to keep in mind something that uh, West Fryer, Dr. West Fryer, who's fantastic. If you're not familiar with his work, uh, check out his blog, speedofcreativity.org. Uh, fantastic blog. One of the things that he passed on many years ago in one of his in one of his workshops was the idea of Harry Potter can fly, meaning Homegrown images are your the the H being in Harry Potter being the A, the H being your homegrown images, okay? your own stuff. Never have to worry about any copyright violation if it's your own stuff. Okay? So, a rule of thumb with with students or in your own professional life, use your own stuff as whenever possible. Okay? If you can't do that, then the P is public domain. If you can't do that, then go to copyright. And last resort, fair use. Harry Potter can fly. So let's talk about your own media. Thankfully, I shouldn't say thankfully, I just signed myself out of my Google account. That's fantastic. Uh, let me sign it back in. Most of us carry a camera and a video recorder and an audio recorder all in our pockets all the time. And I love my Google Photos because I take pictures of all kinds of stuff all the time. Go back into your Google Photos. If you use Amazon Photos, go back in there. Look through your stuff. I encourage teachers and teacher librarians to make B-roll galleries, make classroom B-roll galleries or school-wide B-roll galleries. These could be galleries you make in Google Drive. You can do them in Microsoft Teams. You could even use a shared Dropbox or box.com folder if you, if you use those services where you have students and teachers upload images that they say, yeah, you know what? You can use this image or you can use this video or you can use this, uh, this audio recording and put them into a shared Google Drive, or put them into a shared OneDrive folder, or again, Microsoft Teams or Dropbox. Great way to make sure that your students don't have to go out on the web and do some searching. They can just go right into those folders, those shared folders. Now, that's not always, can we, oh, good question. Oh, good question, Stacy. All right, um, so suppose you use a map around from a textbook. Do you have to cite the source? Are the problems part of the copyright? It depends on the problem, right? If it's two plus two equals four, that's not something that's copyrighted. Uh, and actually one of, the, one of the resources I'm gonna share in just a moment here uh, says something very much to that effect from the Copyright Office of the United States. It's something very much to that effect. If it's a nonfiction thing, right, like a simple math problem, like two plus two equals four, right? someone's going to have a really hard time making a copyright claim against that. Right? If it's something much more complex, like one of the uh, one of the math problems that Dan Myers writes for Desmos, or that Dan Myers wrote on his blog for many years, right, uh, those big word problems, those you may run into some copyright issues where there's a lot of originality in the problem itself. And so it depends on the depth of the, of the would depend on the depth of the problem itself. Um, you know, if, if it's a simple, you know, solve for X in a, in an equation, someone's gonna have a really hard time making a copyright claim for that. But, if it's a much bigger scenario, solve for X in this equation and it's a long word problem or there's a big graphic connected to it, then you have a copyright issue. 
Yeah. Well, so that would have, that would deal with the. So we're, we're what you're delving into there, Stacy, is the originality, the originality of the problem itself. Uh, so let me give you an example of this. So Dan Meyer, uh, great math teacher. I'm, I'm going to bring this up here. And um, so let's say let's say Dan has written up uh, one of his problems. He's written up one of his problems, and it's been copyrighted, uh, or a and by default, anything you write on the web and the images you put up there are copyrighted. You own the copyright when you do that. Okay. So unless he says, this is Creative Commons and you're free to reuse this, uh, going in and copying and pasting it may not be okay. Because in this case here, it doesn't show a Creative Commons license. Now, I'm doing this example off the cuff. In this case, it looks like Dan has actually allowed this one to be, this is Dane, okay, has allowed this one to be copied into your Google Drive. Okay? So he has allowed that. In this case, it has allowed that with that big download button. But in other, other times, it's not. So it depends on the, on the originality of the problem. Right? And that's why it's a really murky area. So, uh, so where to find the copyright-friendly materials we were talking about? We're talking about pictures. Uh, besides your Google Images, Unsplash is a great place to go and look. Uh, Pixabay is also can also be a good place to go, although the filtering on Pixabay is not always suitable for uh, K-8 students. Put it that way. Um, but Unsplash and Pixabay, all the images are licensed to be, in the, all the contributors say that it's in the public domain. You can download it, you can reuse it, you can cite us, but you don't have to cite us. If you're looking for music, Dig CC Mixter is a great place to get. And it's Mixter, not Mixer. Dig CC Mixter is a good place to find music to use in your in your projects. Let me shut off my webcam for just a second. There, I got a little uh, notice that there was some lag in the in the webinar. So, Dig CC Mixter, they make it really obvious uh, when you go to find some music on their site. Let's say we want to find some music for a, for a video. Well, we're going to find some music on their site. They've got all kinds of stuff. I can listen to a little bit of it. All right, let's say I like that music. When I hit the download button, it gives me this great big non-commercial projects only gives me the place, the, um, the citation information that I need to have. It says you are required to give credit to the musicians and then you can download it. So Dig CC Mixter uh, has just instrumentals. All the, the music is instrumental. Uh, so I just point that out. Uh, good question. Uh, there's also a good place if you'd like to, uh, if, you like, if you want sound effects, Sound Bible is one that I've used for more than a decade to find all manner of sound effects, uh, things like, you know, my barking dog. There's our Labrador barking dog. 
perfect. And if we go to download that music or that sound effect, I shouldn't call it a, uh, I shouldn't call it a music, it's sound effect. If I go to download it, okay, and my download options are right here. Now, I should point out there's a lot of ad plastered around the, the download buttons, but I go to download it. We're gonna see there's our license information. And I can download that MP3 file to save that on my computer as well. And so you got a few different options there with the uh, with Sound Bible. You can use the the Wave file or the MP3 file and get a get a download there. Wikimedia and the Wikipedia Wikipedia and the Wikimedia Commons can also be good places to find copyright friendly media, as we saw earlier. Creative Commons has their own built-in search tool. Uh, the image search that's built into Google Docs and Slides can be helpful, but you need to check the source because if I'm using Google Slides and I wanna insert an image, uh, and so I go to, let's say the insert image, and I say search the web, You'll notice over here, I want a picture of a dog. You'll notice that I don't have those, uh, those filter controls over here. So I need to go and make sure before I insert it, say I wanna use that one. I need to go and make sure before I use it that, hey, I can actually use this one. And the way to do that is to blow it up. There's a little, uh, magnifying glass tool blow that up okay. we'll say it's labeled for commercial use with modification right only select images you have confirmed right to learn more and you can insert it there but you always want to double check so i don't know why i just inserted that but i did you always want to double check before you insert using that built-in Google Docs and Slides feature. One other resource that I'll point out for finding this kind of information is the archive.org. So archive.org, if you are looking for things that are in the public domain that are free to download, can be can be good for some topics, but do not send your students there. Okay, you can go there and look. There are millions of resources available. You can go there and look, but there is almost no filtering to speak of. So don't send your students there. But you can go there and look. Uh, you know, the Internet Archive is the world's largest collection. For example, the one of the biggest collections of Grateful Dead music is on the Internet Archive. You can download uh, a lot of old U.S. military training videos. You'll find on the Internet Archive things like that. You know, old. You'll find copies of old textbooks and images from old textbooks and old manuals, you'll find copies of, of old video games and old software on the Internet Archive. But there is, again, no filter, no filtering to speak of in place. So while it can be a good place for you as a teacher to go and find media, it is not necessarily a great place to have your students go to. Uh, you know, maybe I want to look for something about the moon landing. So let's say uh, I want to find a video related to the, the moon landing. So I've selected movies and we'll see all kinds of things here. And so it, it's all over the place in terms of what you'll find. 1970 NASA aeronautics. Right? And I might find that and I might go in and download that and we'll see there's our, our usage rights. But again, 
not filtered in any way in the in the search tools are, are a bit clunky so it uh, can be good but it's not a not always the best place to get to go so a couple of, a couple of examples uh, of how not to cite work <laughs> uh, here's how not to cite an image uh, in this case here the source they listed was just Google Images. Another example here, the source they listed for the image was Facebook. <laughs> so just saying, oh, I found it on Google Images or I found it on Facebook, not really giving attribution to the source. A properly formatted attri attribution is going to include the actual image source it's going to include the date it was included, all the things you would find in a typical MLA or APA formatted uh, citation. And if you're citing it on the web, of course, you want to give a link back to the original source as well. So if you're putting it in, let's say, your Google Classroom or your Microsoft Teams, or you're putting it in your, your classroom website, your classroom blog, you want to put a link back to the original source as well, not just write out the attribute. The, the, credit, but actually link back to that source as well. So I have a, a bunch of additional resources on this. And by the way, I am going to send out an email to everyone who signed up with a copy of these slides and the, the other handout that I, that I mentioned earlier. But some additional resources. This one here, if you're still a little muddy on fair use, the US Copyright Office has four standards for evaluating fair use. And you can blow it up, blow it up right there. And the purpose and character of the use, the nature of the work. And the question that, that was asked about uh, the math problems. So the question in there from Stacy about math problems. This is what I was talking about here. Nature of the copyrighted work. This factor analyzes the degree to which the work that was used relates to copyright's purpose of encouraging creative expression. Thus, using a more creative or imaginative work, such as a novel, movie, or song, is less likely to support a claim of fair use than using a factual work, such as a technical manual or a news item. In addition, use of an unpublished work is less likely to be considered fair. Okay. So you, that gets back to your math problem question, Stacey. Okay, if it's a simple solve for X in this equation, probably really easy to defend a fair use of that, really hard to make a copyright claim. If it's a long, wordy, complex word problem that involves a lot of creativity, less likely to be fair use. Amount and substantiability, substantiability of the portion, right? again, doesn't specify a percentage or an amount, just says it's considered. Right? And the last piece is the effect upon the potential market for the copyrighted work. And this is one that I talk to my students about quite a bit. Some of my students this year are making their own Android applications and they want to use sound in them, sound effects in them. Um, there's a temptation for students to say, well, I, you know, I bought this song on iTunes for $1.29 or whatever they, you know, or Google Play for $1.29 or $1.50 or whatever. Therefore, I have used to, rights to use it. No, you have the right to listen to it. You say, well, it's not going to hurt anything if I just use it. Say, well, it, but it does hurt things. It does hurt that artist because there's a very big difference between paying for the right to listen to a song for $1.29 and paying for the right to reuse and redistribute a song. Those licensing, those licenses are very, very different. An example that some of some of you might might remember: uh, 
the Rolling Stones had the Rolling Stones song Satisfaction is reported to be one of the most expensive songs to license to use. Uh, I haven't been able to nail down a figure, but the figures that I've seen range anywhere between seventy-five thousand and one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars to license the work Satisfaction to reuse. But as you all know, you can go on Google Play and listen to the Rolling Stones play Satisfaction for $1.29. Very different licenses. And that's the part of the potential market value or an example of that. Stanford University has some great resources on this topic. Kathy Schrock has a huge list of lesson resources for lessons on this topic. Uh, I'm going to point out an article that I wrote a few years, a couple years back. Uh, the Houston ISD, do I have anyone from Houston here today who wants to talk about this? No. <laughs> All right. Just want to check, make sure I didn't have anyone from, from Houston here today who wanted to talk about this uh, or had firsthand experience with it, I should say. Uh, so a couple of years ago, the Houston ISD got hit with a $9.2 million judgment uh, for copyright violations for making photocopies of workbooks and textbooks that said, hey, uh, clearly this is copyrighted, not for redistribution without buying more copies of it. And they went ahead and made copies and copies and copies. And the publisher said, please stop doing that. And said many times, please stop doing that. And they kept doing it. And finally they went to court and the, and the court said, no, you need to pay $9.2 million. I believe they ended up settling for less than $9.2 million, but still, it does happen. It does happen. If you want students to cite their work, I just published recently a, a, a list of good tools to help students cite their work. And I want to uh, point out some lesson plan resources. Copyright and creativity.org has good lesson plans for elementary school students. Read, write, think has a really good one on downloading music and what does it mean when you download music that was that one's designed for for high school students uh, common sense education's lesson plan here uh, is designed for middle school students the four factors of fair use so that's a good one for your middle school students and c-span classroom has one that's also good for high school students the role of Congress in music licensing. So those are four lesson plans right there. Uh, some people sent me questions in advance of today's webinar and I was happy to get those. So I wanna tackle them right now. Uh, this is a topic, by the way, that we could go on for hours and hours about. Um, let's grab this. Um, oh, question just missed it, missed in there. Yes, generally you get a cease and desist notice before a lawsuit. Yes, <laughs> generally, generally no, generally people do not jump right to a, do not jump right to a to a lawsuit because it's really expensive to file a lawsuit. Uh, sending a cease and desist notice you can do for, you know, fifty bucks, fifty dollars, um, or less, right? Uh, and in fact, depending on depending on where the copyright violation is happening, it may cost you, it may cost nothing at all. If it's a copyright violation uh, on YouTube, for example, and you're the and you're the copyright owner, uh, filing that notice doesn't take any time at all. It doesn't take more than a, a few clicks. Uh, if you're the copyright owner for some written work and you're going after a website that's using your work, or you're the copyright owner for a for a photograph and you're going after a website it might take a little bit more effort to track down who the who owns the website and sending them a notice uh, but it, it, but uh, that cease and desist notice is usually the first step right? uh, so here's a question that came in earlier uh, earlier today before we started and it was oh sorry i want to create a read watch listen activity which gives students a choice on how they want to learn the problem is the listen portion i love using podcasts but there aren't a ton out there for students with specific topics the plant the plant life cycle for example 
So if I was to find an article online and record myself reading it, how would that work as far as uploading it to a slides or seesaw activity and sharing it? Do I have rights to do so? So when I was reading this question, when I thought about this question, my first response, my first instinct was to say, well, no, that's not how it was intended to be used by the original writer. But then I thought about it a little bit more. And what this person was describing is not terribly different than having a student use a Chrome extension or use Microsoft's immersive reader to have the page read aloud to them. I think if you're reading it verbatim and putting it into those slides or that seesaw for obviously an educational purpose, and you're not doing anything to, let's say, avoid paying for rights to that article. Right? Let's assume it's an article that's publicly available on, you know, let's say, CNN.com, and you're reading that article aloud in, uh, and making that MP3 file of you reading it aloud and putting it into your slides, your seesaw activity. I don't think that's terribly different than having students use that read aloud function in your web browser to have access to that material. Um, so that's my that's my take on that particular item. Uh, now it, it would be different if it was something that was behind a paywall. If the article was behind a paywall, let's say it was on uh, a journal, a scientific journal that required you to have a subscription in order to access that article and then you read the article aloud and make an MP3 recording of it as a way to get around your students having to have subscriptions to that, uh, to that journal, then I think you have a problem. But if it's a, a publicly available article and you're just reading it aloud in this context, I think you're okay. I think you'd be fine. There's another question that came up. Uh, the media specialist in my school feels it's okay to use images that have watermarks on them in our school news videos under the educational fair use copyright guidelines because they're not being used to make a profit, nor are the images being distorted or changed. Never mind the fact they should be using images from sites that have copyright free images. Is she correct in her reasoning that she can use any picture, including ones with watermarks uh, under fair use guidelines? No, uh, because the other part of fair use to consider in an academic setting right, is how it's being used. Right? How is it being used? Is it being used for an instructional, for a true instructional purpose? Right? Is it being used because uh, the image that you found is going to be really useful in your instruction? Let's say a picture of the Mona Lisa, right? That's a great example. Picture of the Mona Lisa, and you're going to talk about the, the shading and the light. And, right, that's a classic work. Right? Okay, you can make an example for that. Or a photograph of a bridge, right? uh, let's say a, you know, an ancient Roman bridge that someone's taken a photograph of and you can't find anything else that's captured the arch and the, and the stonework the same way and you are teaching stonework. We actually have a masonry school here in Maine, by the way. Uh, <laughs> one, of the one of the few in the country still, then, Okay, that's a fair use because you're using that image to teach that specific concept in that lesson. And there might be nothing else like it. But if it's just you're using it because you wanna have some pretty images in your school newsletter, that's not really an instructional purpose. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Um, yeah. So the question, uh, question about the, about the uh, about where is the where's the sound file being shared? There, there is that there is that concern as well. And this came up with a different question that I got a couple of weeks ago, and I didn't put it in here. Uh, but someone asked me about Canvas and taking materials and putting them in a Canvas classroom, Canvas LMS system. And you take materials, put it in a Canvas system, and you and if that material was already in the public domain, you're fine. If that material was already Creative Commons licensed, you're fine. If that material is copyrighted, then you need to make a fair use for it. 
they need to make a fair use argument for it. Because once you put something in Canvas and, and it becomes password protected, then it's uh, then you then you're making it harder to access it, and you may be taking away from the original per, the original publisher, the original creator's ability to earn money from it, unless you're making a fair use argument for it. And the same is true when you if you are someone who's making courses for let's say Teachable or Teachers Pay Teachers, and you're selling access to those materials. Make sure you read that Creative Commons license very carefully to make sure that it says it's okay for commercial reuse. So, you know, if you are making lesson plans and you sell some of them on, on Teachers Pay Teachers, the rules for what you use in your classroom might be different than what they are for what you sell on Teachers Pay Teachers because Teachers Pay Teachers becomes a commercial use. So I've gone on for an hour about this topic today, and I could go on for six more hours about this if I, if I wanted to, uh, but I won't today. Uh, I will conclude with this. I will say that uh, I am going to send an email to everyone who signed up, all 68 of you who signed up for the webinar. You'll get an email from me tomorrow morning around 5 a.m., depending on when my toddlers wake up. Uh, <laughs> but around 5 a.m. tomorrow morning, you'll get an email from me that has a copy of today's slides, a copy of the handouts I mentioned, and a, rec and a recording of today's webinar as well. And finally, I love answering questions about this topic. So feel free to email me at any time, richard at burn.media, and I will answer any and all questions about this topic uh, that you have. And if you ever do need an intellectual property lawyer, last little plug I'll put in here. If you ever do need an intellectual property lawyer, I went to college with a great one who works for Oracle now in their, in their legal affairs department. And I can put you in touch with him if you ever really need an intellectual property lawyer. Uh, I'd be more than happy to give you a reference to him. Uh, he's, a, he's a good guy. We, we still ride mountain bikes together. Good guy. All right. Anyway. Uh, have a great night, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me, and I will see you on the web sometime soon. Bye-bye.